Uh, I want to introduce Redbeard to you, and he's going to talk about new data mining techniques and uh, aggregation techniques of all kinds of data, like DNA and pictures from the web for face recognition and open source uh, implementations of this. Give a big round of applause to Redbeard. So, as was mentioned, uh, my name is Ray Beard. Uh, the talk idea that we've got going on here is going to be a survey of data collection techniques and how dragnets are increasingly being done uh, on a larger and larger scale. You know, the idea of a dragnet being where you are mining a specific corpus of information about a group of people in order to narrow it down very quickly without having to do necessarily the same due diligence of research that you'd have to. So really what we're doing here is we are discussing where or what happens when data collection starts going haywire here. Uh, I'm here today representing the Institute for Anarchist Studies uh, out of the United States. Uh, we do a number of programs every year, including RAT, uh, Renewing the Anarchist Tradition, and a few other things. Uh, feel free to check out the website. There's all kinds of interesting things going on. We publish books, things like that. But moving on, interesting stuff. So the main idea of what we're talking about here is paranoia. You know, and really, why shouldn't it be? I mean, we're really talking about paranoia. I mean, we've got so many different angles and vectors in which we are leaking data constantly. And there is someone there with the digital vacuum cleaner to both pick it up as well as sell it and market it and use it against us. So we're really going to focus on two areas here. And that's going to be both the before and the after. The before being the you know, the process of what companies are doing to begin to collect this data, the strategies that they're taking, and the after is going to be um, what you do once these strategies are in place. Um, we're going to cover uh, data collection, uh, who's responsible for doing these things, and that's both on the before side. On the after side, we're going to discuss data processing as well as some of the countermeasures. And then towards the end, we're going to get into the ramifications for everything. You know, what's actually, uh, what's happening when the rubber hits the road here. So we're just going to jump into it and start talking about data collection. So we're going to be discussing uh, some facial recognition techniques. We're, uh, we're going to be discussing uh, DNA profiling, DNA collection. Uh, again, there is so much to talk about in this sphere that it's going to be 10 miles wide, sorry, 60 kilometers wide and about a centimeter and a half deep. Um, so you'll have to bear with me. I mean, we're, there's going to be more traditional biometric uh, techniques, iris uh, scanning, fingerprint scanning. Um, very brief talk about uh, geoprofiling, geolocation data. And then also, we're going to discuss surveillance cameras. Surveillance cameras and specifically facial recognition are pretty fascinating. And it's getting borderline terrifying, some of the stuff that's able to be done on that. Um, so let's just jump in this and talk about who is actually responsible. So one of the core focuses of this is going to be the infrastructure component of it. These are the companies that are making their business building various components to spy on you as much as possible. And one of them is Oracle. Uh, Larry needs a new boat, so he's going to keep on coming up with all kinds of uh, neat ways to collect as much data as possible. One of the newer ones that, he's, that uh, Oracle has produced is Oracle Data Mining. You'll see that there's lots of things in quotes throughout this, which is where I found just genius marketing quotes on all of these things. Um, Oracle Data Mining is a modification to the SQL Developer Suite that allows a business logic individual to point and click their way through all of the data that's been collected and shoved into an Oracle database. Now, it's only actually as powerful as the intelligence that's been put in there. You know, you're going to have to make sure that things are the right data types. You're going to have to make sure that the right pieces of information have been collected in the first place. But if that's been done, and don't worry, Oracle will give you consultants to ensure that this has been done right at a, at a very large premium. Um, then they're just going to keep selling you software that allows you to start looking at this data in new ways and getting at it faster and faster and faster. Um, you know, another company here that we've got is the Department of Homeland Security. And this isn't something that folks would traditionally think of as an infrastructure provider. 
Um, but they are. I mean, one of the main things that they're now doing is the Global Entry Program. You know, I'm, I'm sure that any of you who have come to the U.S. recently have been greeted by our lovely individuals in Customs and Border Patrol who are just itching to get your fingerprints and a photograph and all kinds of stuff. And what is actually happening here is they are working towards building the largest corpus of information on individuals held by a government. I mean, that's, that's one of the goals of this, is to be able to say, we have this information on individuals, and we have gone to the effort of indexing it in such a way that we can quickly look up things. You know, the, the argument for global entry has been that, you know, the, the terrorists who came after America 9-11, they, they used their real names on that airplane, and if we had just been able to look it up the right way, then none of that would have happened. Well, I mean, woulda, shoulda, coulda. There's, there's a lot of things that went wrong in that situation, and I don't think that personally, you know, having every single visitor who comes to the U.S., you know, have a dossier built on them is necessarily the best strategy. Again, could be wrong. I'm one guy. Oh, yeah, and now they're building in uh, facial recognition and iris scanning, too. So when you get that photograph done, they're going to make sure that they get to real close up in there. But we're going to be discussing some of this here in a little bit, too. Um, another company that's pretty interesting here is Digital Signal Corporation. Uh, Digital Signal Corporation, their whole deal is that they are marketing um, things to make the world safe. You know, again, they, that's, that's their big deal. You know, they are delivering the only precision long-range identity solution. And we're talking about facial recognition. We're talking about being able to take a high-resolution camera and take a photo of you and map it in the right way and collect the right data points out of it and then store it in such a way that they're able to make sure that you are you and someone else is someone else. Um, now, the fascinating thing about this is one of the rollouts of it is going to be the 2014 World Cup, uh, where their goal is to give people, or give the, the military police, because again, this isn't just, you know, standard US police, this is dudes who will be running around with machine guns while trying to keep people safe at the World Cup. Um, they're going to give them, as the, uh, uh, Tribune in London said, Robocop glasses. Um, now, all that I imagine happening here is one of those guys kirking out and Ed 209 <laughs> telling somebody that there's 10 seconds to comply and murdering them, but I mean, this is just me kind of living out my 14-year-old suburban white uh, G.I. Joe watching fantasy. Um, moving on. So we also have the FBI. We had Department of Homeland Security, why not have the FBI? Uh, and specifically, that's because the FBI runs this thing called CODIS. Now, CODIS is, stands for two things. They couldn't just make it one, of course. It's, well, specifically the CODIS unit handles the combined DNA index system and it handles the national DNA index system. And, you know, it's a standard sort of thing where CODIS is going through and it's saying that we are going to be responsible for kind of the DNA database uh, for law enforcement uh, in the United States. But don't worry, don't worry, they're going to make sure that selected international law enforcement has access to this too. So I, I realize that folks here in Germany were kind of getting skittish that they might not be able to be tracked by the U.S. database. Don't worry, it's, it's going to happen. You know, we're, we're ensuring that. You know, we don't want to leave anyone out here. Um, and, you know, and in the end, this is just infrastructure. This is just the components where we're talking about, you know, it, it's the stuff. You know, at the end of the day, it's just something in a box. We've got to have somebody to do something with it. So we're going to start out with the low-hanging fruit here, and it's going to be funny slash boring slash a big face palm, but, you know, we'll just start out with America Online. And the only reason that I bring them up is their 2006 data publishing situation that they had, where they published a search corpus where they removed identifying information from it and replaced it with a unique key. Now, each person had a unique key tied to them. So if you did a vanity search in that three-month period, well, 
congratulations, you identified yourself. But there were some really fascinating searches here too that you could go through. So you'd find someone searching for murder and untraceable poison and insurance money and how to hide the body. And you know, while this doesn't give away anything per se about that individual, it does show you that you know you can that it's trivial for these companies to be able to go through and look at what happens, at what one individual is doing. And this is just one search engine. And, and I, I'd go so far as to say that this is kind of the lowest common denominator search engine. I mean, we're talking 2006, and these are people who have logged into AOL probably because they still think that they need it on top of their broadband connection and type something into the keyword bar. Now, this does not make for the master criminal who is trying to figure out how to hide the body and collect the insurance money, but it does, on the flip side of it, show how, you know, a company with a bit more wherewithal in how they were to track things might be able to do something with that. Now, I would go so far as to say that at the same time, Google is well-worn territory. You know, we, we can sit in ham and haw about it. There's enough other people talking about Google that we can just skip on. And Facebook, you know, they're marginally interesting, but I'm much, much more interested in Face.com. And that's one of their partners. Face.com's whole deal is that they are providing facial recognition APIs to other websites. Now, just like many uh, data stream providers, they have a sharing agreement. So, you know, we'll, we'll show you ours if you show us yours. And, you know, the, the end result of this is that you're ending up with this hosted service that Facebook's use. Facebook uses and lots and lots of other websites. If you do a Google search for photo tagger, um, I mean, you're going to find quite a lot of chaff in that. But at the same time, there's some fascinating examples of people uploading like 25 photos of them and their friends. And it's like, oh, I see that, you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry are all in this and, you know, picks out with little boxes over their faces. And the reason that that exists is because it's been crowdsourced. Your friends post your photo up there even though you don't have a Facebook account and they tag your name to it. Or you do have a Facebook account and you don't remove the tag and, well, that being said, Facebook doesn't delete anything ever. So even when you have been tagged, you can remove it publicly, but it's still there. And it's not going away. Um, Amazon. Amazon's one is both neat and has been in the news quite a bit in the past week. And you know, we'll, we'll get to the, the latest instance of this right at the end, but they have 59 or records on 59 million active customers. That's people who shop at Amazon. And for folks who are not from the Pacific Northwest in the United States, you might not know that in that area, Amazon will even deliver your groceries. So, you know, they know what books you read, they know what movies you watch, they know even more now that you're using their streaming video service and rating it and giving them more information about what you like, but they also know that you bought, you know, 25, 25 bags of popcorn because you're a slovenly individual who wants to then sit and watch uh, episodes of CSI back to back to back on their streaming video service. But it goes one step further because recently, um, they've expanded the analytics and demographic information on this by receiving U.S. patent number 8,060,463. Um, and while he doesn't have anything directly to do with it, I would like to give a shout out to my friend John, who works for the U.S. Patent Service and does his best to, I mean, he works in uh, video development, but, you know, video drivers, uh, monitor screens, things like that. But we often have talks about the ways in which uh, he just wishes that his job could be easier, and it's not by having to deal with bullshit patents like this, which in this specific case is mining of user event data to identify users with common interests. It's a great title for a patent. Specifically, where the rubber hit the road on this one, the, the big example that keeps coming out is that I buy you a gift, and then I pay a dollar to have Amazon gift wrap it, and when I pick out the image of it, I just happen to pick, you know, something covered in crosses. And you know, it, while Amazon doesn't understand that they wrapped it upside down and it's a bunch of upside down crosses, you know, and they, they now think that you're 
Catholic, but um, it, they're going so far as to making these kinds of assumptions because the information that they store on you is much, much, much more valuable the more complete it is. The better of an image that they can give of you to other marketers, the more those marketers are willing to pay for access to it. And, you know, I, I gotta say, I'm not saying anything during this talk that's, that's really rocket science. It's, you know, it's just going through and reading lots of boring white papers and, you know, things on Slashdot and reading terms of service on websites. And I, I really don't recommend that any of you go to that extent. But going back to our, one of the very first things that we discussed, that healthy dose of paranoia is what helps you, again, on the before side of this. Now, moving on from Amazon, um, there's this company called Axiom. Uh, Axiom is a data marketing company of a different sort. Um, they sell mailing lists. They sell personal information. And when I say personal information, I mean if you purchase their premium service, results of your drug tests, results of your you know, searches on criminal history, and your education data, because you know, after all, when, you know, at least in the US, all these universities are hard up for money, and they will sell anything they can about you to try to augment their sports budget. Um, this company even produces a secondary premium feed called the Suspected Terrorist Watch List. Now, they, when, when prompted about this, you know, this isn't anything maintained by the U.S. government. This is just their opinion. They said that this is so that you can weed out untruthful employees. If you think that your employees might be terrorists, I think you have bigger issues. <laughs> if you, I mean, but let's talk about untruthful for a second, because this isn't for untruthful employees. The whole purpose of this is so that they can sell these things to advertisers. Point blank. There's, there's nothing more than that. You know, there's, there's going to be a few individuals who are like, oh, yeah, yeah, if, if, if we hire these people, the terrorists will win. And, you know, it, it's, it's ancillary money. It, you know, it's, it's gravy. You're, you're taking all of the data that you've already got, you're putting a slightly different spin on it, and you're finding a new way to sell it. Um, but this is really, you know, when we're, when we're talking about service providers, choice point, awesome. Awesome, they're, they're really great. So, as of a year and a half ago, they contain 17 billion discrete records. Now, okay, a record is, you know, a phone number for you. It's, it's one specific address. You know, it's, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, you happen to buy something from Amazon. So, I mean, 17 billion, it just, it's one of those huge that's really hard to kind of comprehend. So. But that 17 billion is on 220 million people. So while this is spread globally, you know, we're talking two thirds of the United States. We're talking a bunch of countries in Europe, the entire population. I mean, it's spread out. I mean, these, this, is, this is me, you know, coming up with things off the cuff to sound scary, because it is. I mean, this, there is no reason that this information should should be worth that kind of money. But they're getting it for free. And they're getting it from weird places. And a lot of the times, you know, it might be questionable. You know, in the US, not who you voted for, but whether you voted is a matter of public record. Whether or not you went to the polls. Now, if you're like, Joe Blow average person. I mean, this is data that's published by states in something called um, a voter file is going to list addresses. It's going to list your party affiliation and the years in which you vote. Well, if you vote party ticket like most people, that effectively means that they have sold who you voted for. I mean, it's, it's cut and dry. You know, they get hold of DNA information from prisons. 
or from it, situations like the city of Santa Clara in California. The city of Santa Clara has started taking cheek swabs from people who are suspected of crimes. Not charged, but suspected of crimes. And companies like this get a hold of that information, buying it from federal, state, and local governments, and then they start aggregating it. Now, Choice Point specifically was the auditor who was brought in in 2000 during the presidential election when Florida had like, you know, half of a percent margin because of how badly they designed their ballots and everything else. I mean, depending on who you talk to, there's a lot of reasons there. But in 2000, they nullified 94,000 votes. I feel like a fool right now because I, I, I should have done the due diligence on this, but I seem to recall that that being something that very, that did a fantastic job of closing the gap in deciding that specific presidential race. Because it came down to the single state of Florida and this auditing process of which they were a part. So 94,000 votes were thrown out due to criminal conviction, but the issue is, is that only 3,000 of those had verifiable criminal convictions that made them ineligible to vote. That's not to say that all 94, or that, you know, 40,000 of them did not have something criminal in their past, which at one point would have made them ineligible to vote. But at the time of the election, they were only able to come up with 3% of those individuals whose votes were thrown away that now were forced to I mean, that decided the election. So it gets into these questions of how is the fact that you are now also collecting DNA information from people in prison, how is that biased? How does that allow you to very quickly say, well, I know that this person has red hair and a propensity to grow a pretty kicking beard, um, <laughs> you know, it makes it very, very easily to start narrowing down who you think is involved and implicated in all kinds of different situations. I mean, maybe you're using this information to try to market me the best conditioner possible. And, you know, if you are, then more power to you. I'll give it a shot. You know, I'm, I'm the same, you know, consumer prostitute that most of us are. And, you know, you just need to find the right way to, to frame it. But... We've been talking about service providers. Let's, let's go into some of the contractors. I mean, these are the individuals that are actually doing all this stuff. There's a huge global contractor called Accenture. Accenture is pretty much just a body shop. They will give you people to do anything that you want, and they will tell you that they will do whatever you need. Um, if you're trying to write an application, then you'll probably get 50,000 monkeys with 50,000 typewriters. And if the contract is big enough, in the case of the U.S. government, you might actually end up with something. I mean, $10 billion buys a lot of human time. And this dossier system became something that we discussed earlier called global entry. So it's a web. And like I said, it's paranoia. And it's maybe these things really aren't connected, but I'm sitting there like that awful mass market movie Sherlock Holmes that just came out where he's got like strings going all over the place and you know Watson's tripping over it and you know there there are moments when I'm like maybe I shouldn't leave the house <laughs> I mean there are many other moments when other people tell me I shouldn't leave the house or that I should put on pants and things like that but I mean it's all beside the point um, we've got more more contractors to discuss code focus is an, is another great one um, so, not to cast aspersions here, but I would say that it's a pretty commonly held belief that Canadians are relatively mild folk. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. I mean, this is, this is, you know, somebody coming from the U.S., you know, we have murders everywhere. You know, you saw Michael Moore movies. Murders don't happen in Canada, all that kind of stuff. But code focus... They are a company based in Canada. And when the, when the social challenge, when, when the, the call to action rose after the, the city of Vancouver's dearly beloved hockey team lost, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, by the way, I'm hesitant to even call them contractors. I mean, they basically, it's giving them too much credit. They sat down with the Facebook API for about 20 minutes and didn't even understand half of it. And, you know, kind of <laughs> came up with a strategy there. Um, and they said, you know, the city of Vancouver is in the grip of crime. You know, the hero that they need who is Batman is fictional and won't be coming, so they're going to rise to the occasion. And they produced the website identifyrioters.com. Now, if you have never seen this website, it pulls photos directly from Facebook, riot porn, and allows you to click on the people in the individuals, and, or the individuals in the photo, and type in their name. And it notifies the Vancouver Police Department. Oh, and since they're using Facebook's API, it's notifying face.com and a bunch of these other places. And, you know, remember, you can always directly tip the Vancouver Police Department as well. But Code Focus is this company, and it's really hard to see, but it's, you know, they're very, very specific in saying that it was developed by them for the limited liability corporation known as Identify Rioters. That way, you know, when they potentially falsely accuse people. Oh yeah, one other thing, speaking of falsely accused, the website was up for about a week before they threw in the word alleged in front of Rioter. There was just, you know, a little bit of minutia there, but... Yeah, some of these photos are, you know, marginally interesting. Um, I, I do take issue with one of the photos, though. I mean, that guy, he's just having a great time. Um, this guy. And this has actually become kind of a, a meme photo. Um, let me just suggest one thing. I realize that he's a sports fan. You know, some of us come from a uh, social justice background, so we're familiar with different tactics. But let me just suggest that you don't wear those shoes if you're going to try to blow up a police car and there's someone photographing you. I mean, let's just leave your face out of it. If you are wearing custom orange and blue neon Nike kicks, you know, somebody's probably going to identify you. And, I mean, this is crowdsourcing data entry. This is now literally like a censure, 50,000 monkeys with 50,000 typewriters. Sorry, guys. Each one of you has a typewriter. You're using it. But, um, and, yeah, it, it's just one of those, are we, we don't need to talk about these guys, do we? I mean, it's a bunch of clowns. I mean, like the contractor category, yes. We'll talk about HP Gary. Um, so we've gone over a little bit of who is responsible. Um, but at the same time, we need to get into the data processing side of it. This is going to be, you know, now that some of this data has been collected, now that your friends have ratted you out on Identify Rioters, and now that uh, Oracle has produced, you know, their data mining utilities, what is actually being done with this? So, one of the things is data storage. You now have huge, huge, huge corpuses of information. What do you do with it? Um, and on the one hand, you have to come up with customized engines for storing it. And yes, when I say customized engines, I mean database type things. Um, and on the open source side, you know, you've got, you, you can define custom data types within lots of different open source databases. I mean, you've got that, you've got PostGIS. PostGIS is an extension to Postgres that allows you to directly store like lat long data types. So if you're working with uh, mapping type information, you don't have to store it as an int and then hope that, you know, your developers are going to do something with it. It builds in actual functions at the database layer so that your code becomes, your SQL code can become more intelligent about ripping that information out as fast as possible. And it's familiarization with these data types and, you know, actual real computer science. You know, we're not talking about, you know, getting a comp sci degree and then being, you know, somebody who's just churning out code for seven hours a day, you know, and hoping for an hour and a half lunch when you should really just have an hour. I mean, this is, this is individuals who sit and model data types and try to come up with the most efficient ways possible to actually store all of this. And you know, PostGIS is one. Uh, DNA Nexus is another. Now, DNA Nexus, they're providing a cloud data storage set up specifically for DNA information. Um, 
Yeah, good luck when that gets popped. Uh, so, but the other side of it is we're moving more and more into object-based storage. And this is going to be ways that developers can directly access these things abstracted out from the disk and being able to get at bigger chunks. You know, we're talking about partition IDs at a 64-bit length, object IDs within that partition at a 64-bit length. And all of this is built on top of the actual SCSI standard. You know, they're in the process of ratifying the third object storage type here for, uh, you know, building on the SCSI standard. I mean, they, they did one in, I believe, 2003, one in 2008, and then they're coming up with this one now as well. Um, and then each one of these objects stores both, you know, the actual data that you're worried about, but an extensible metadata. So as you begin to build out these custom data types, as you begin to make the database side more intelligent, you know, you can store information about, you know, you don't have to put your blobs in the database. You can now store them on the file system and have them abstracted out that way. Um, and, you know, it, it links it all together. These are those things where developers and folks, folks working with Hadoop and MapReduce and all that, they get real excited about uh, object-based data storage. But, I mean, this goes beyond into mining of other data types as well. So, um, but, you know, we're talking about this because we're talking about big data. I hate big data, but, you know, big. And, you know, citing personal experience, you know, I've, I was working with a client not too long ago who their data set that they were working with was one petabyte. You know, they, and this is spread across multiple, like, huge SANs. And, I mean, this, in the grand scheme of things, this isn't even that big. This is just, you know, me being one guy, and, you know, who am I? I'm just some guy with a huge beard who's standing here talking about gibberish on this front. And, you know, any individual or any organization, for example, the CIA, who's hand classifying five million tweets a day and probably saving a copy of those, they're going to need something where they can easily be able to dig through all of that. Now, Okay, so you've got this, these data types. So what do you do with it? You know, this light field cameras, they go into a little bit of a gray area. You know, light field technology is something that was come up with at Stanford about 15 years ago. Um, for lack of a better term, um, it's being able to take a photo at every f-stop at the same time. I mean, that means that everything in your depth, I mean, you're taking a photo at all depths of field. Um, and the way that they do this is, you know, they've got a huge lens set up, and um, it's not the best description, but it's kind of like taking light at, uh, at different uh, phases and being able to capture them separately so that you can drag through that depth of field by storing it in, you know, their specific type. So, you know, in this case, you see we've got all of these Santas in the background who are, you know, jolly and crystal clear and you can't see it that well, but the same photo you can actually refocus on this guy's face. You have both macro and micro in the same actual photo. Well, what happens when this starts getting used with security cameras? I mean, this camera that was used right there, you can purchase it today. It costs 400 US dollars. So what happens when somebody goes, you know, that's enough that I can use this color camera in a security situation. And now if I can afford $100 for a two terabyte disk, I can store all of these images. And then I can go back and I can play with it at need if I can find a way to actually rip out the information that I'm looking for. So you know, these, these are things to think about, you know, it, but it's not even just that it's a total focus camera, you know, they're, they're starting to use these things for 3D rendering as well. So now you have multiples of these cameras and you can actually produce a 3D image of a situation. You know, possibly that ends up with, you know, building a better image of a crime scene. Maybe that's being able to measure more accurate distance, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ramifications for it, but it's just one thing that you're able to do. Now, if we're going to talk about algorithms, we can also talk about Palantir for a second. Um, Palantir is an organization based out of California. Um, they 
will be very, very quick to tell you that they, do, they are not a data mining company. They produce algorithms. They work with companies like H.B. Gary to do that mining and then but the idea is, you know, it's going to be try to be presented that it's a, you know, by hackers for hackers sort of situation. You know, it's it's individuals, you know, who see what this tool can do and they get real excited. You know, it's it's neat. You know, it gets back into that, you know, 14-year-old suburban white male neat factor. You know, wouldn't nuclear war be neat? Yes, it would until you're dead. I mean, I I'm not going to front. I yeah, nuclear war would be. I'd like to see if I could hack it. Let's get real though, I'm dead. Like, I, I can't hack it, I'm dead. And, and individuals that think that, you know, the master's house is going to build a new master's house with these tools and not end up just really kind of from behind is kind of out of their skull a little bit. I mean, this is by hackers, for hackers, against hackers. I mean, the, the thing to keep in mind here is that this is the company that lambasted WikiLeaks and other data sharing services and actually produced presentations for the US government about how to effectively destroy them. Let's leave politics of WikiLeaks aside. This is an organization who wants to destroy the public collection and collocation of information and keep it privatized in the hands of companies that are paying for it. I mean, it's, it's reasonably cut and dry, and that's where my problem comes in with it. You've got awesome, awesome algorithms? Sweet. You're going to take a political agenda on it? Okay. You're going to, you know, publish these webs of trust off of uh, Twitter, you know, and there's a fascinating article that Wired wrote uh, about, I guess, about a year ago. Um, where their, their sample image has one of the presenters from this year and last year at CCC just like dead center in the image. So it's clearly they're, they're drawing a line in the sand that they, they want someone to see. But the thing that is going to get a lot of people excited is just talking about countermeasures. You know, okay, now you messed up, you're in these databases, what do you do? Or the infrastructure exists, how do you avoid it? So people get, they love talking about facial recognition, so we're going to spend quite a bit of time there, at least in comparison. So it's done via measurements, you know. They, the facial recognition guidelines say, you know, that the things that they are going to check for is they're going to look for mirrored images, they're going to look for a neutral expression on your face. You know, when they do the registration photos, they don't want you smiling. They don't want you doing anything like that. They want you as relaxed as possible. And part of the reason for that is, you'll see in one of my sample images that I've got later, that's because they start modifying your face, trying to put a smile on you and removing it and doing goofy stuff and this just gives them a clean data source to start from. You know, they want you to not be wearing glasses. Again, they can put the glasses on you. It's harder for them to take it off. Um, you know, and they want diffused light. You know, they don't want any kind of spotlights or anything like that on it. And, you know, they, if, if possible, they'd love to have multiple angles. You know, well, guess what? The, all those photos that your friends posted on Facebook, well, that gave them multiple angles, you know, if they happen to correlate those together. And the thing that surprised me is that it's acceptable to have, you know, yaw, pitch, and roll of up to 15 degrees in each direction on the photos. Like, they, they can handle that without a problem. It's, you know, only when you start getting outside of that that they need to, that the civil service worker who's making barely over minimum wage is like, can you take the photo again? I mean, this is the way that it goes, at least uh, when I had to renew my driver's license most recently. Um, but even more than that, we should talk about, as far as facial recognition, what's working and what doesn't work. You know? So complexion and lighting, uh, that's one of those things where you know, if you can change your complexion, you know, it, 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 let's not front. It's not going to do anything. You know, it's, it's a low in, lowest common denominator. They're going to be able to mess with hue, brightness, saturation, contrast, all that to really get around it. But, and it's generally easy to take care of. Um, the, I will say, 
I will say that as far as light and complexion goes, there is a fascinating problem, and that is that individuals of color, specifically individuals with dark skin complexions, because of the increased problem in defining contrast on their faces, um, it's harder for them to be detected by facial recognition software. You know, so specifically, this means that um, there's an inflammatory, slash maybe borderline funny, video uh, from about a year and a half ago where these individuals claimed that uh, Hewlett Packard explicitly made racist facial recognition software because the 640 by 480 webcam on the top of the computer running software that cost $29.99 couldn't properly figure out, you know, facial details of a very dark skinned complexion man in low light. This, this was, you know, unacceptable for them, so painting uh, Hewlett Packard as racist on that. And we'll talk about plastic surgery. I mean, this is one where, yes, plastic surgery will work. You rearrange your face, your face is rearranged. It's... <laughs> My man, he's on top of it. Um, <laughs> so, um, beards are pretty effective, at least as far as measured by a bunch of the papers that I was reading. But it, while they're effective, it's more funny in how they deal with it. So, like, right now, they try to figure out, you know, whether or not a photo of you is a photo of you, know, you if you have a beard or might have a beard by pre-processing pre -processing the images and doing lots of stuff to it. You know? So they, sam you know, they sample out facial, theories, facial features and then they start putting fake beards around it. I'm, I'm not kidding you. Like, these individuals in Turkey, they, they published this paper on how to deceive a face recognizer. And it's, you know, if you want sources for any of this stuff I've got, them, you know, I've got them all on my laptop right now, it's pretty funny, but this is their sample image. They take that guy, oh man, we'll get to Jimmy, we'll get to Jimmy here in one second, but they specifically take this guy right there on the end, and then they squint his eyes, and then they put that mustache on him, and then they put sunglasses on him, and then they put the mustaches and the sunglasses, you know, trying to do their best Unabomber impression, and, you know, this is what is actually being done as a technique to try to figure out if that is indeed the case. And I am now going backwards, okay. Um, so, you know, we've got Jimmy here, and effectively what they're doing is they're putting my beard on Jimmy. Like, that's their strategy to try to see if we are the same person. I, I assure you, we are not. Jimmy and I have discussed this at length. Um, <laughs> but, the specific technology, the specific strategy that was brought up here was CV Dazzle. So CV Dazzle is specifically an implementation of a previous technology strategy, depending on what you want to call it, called Dazzle. Uh, it's camouflage. You know, you're, you're painting these geometric lines on something. In this case, they, they did it on ships uh, during World War I. And the, the idea was is that it breaks up the ability to pick out specific components of it, kind of like a, you know, a herd of zebra, and harder to target any one specific thing on there. Uh, all this work has been done by a gentleman named Adam Harvey out of Brooklyn. The, the research is fascinating. I mean, there's code. It's all going to be open source. He's rewriting it in Java right now or C++, one, one or the other. Um, and specifically, they're referring to computer vision dazzling. Um, so, quote directly from him is, they want it to be an antagonistic technology. They want this to not per se make facial recognition software more effective, but to clown it. You know, they, they want to show that it's absurd. Um, and I already realized that I forgot to fix one thing with these slides, so I'm going to have to scroll down a little bit by hand, but the goal is, you know, to the best part here is to be deceptively fashionable and functionally deceptive. I mean, it's awesome. So let me, let me really zoom out here because these are all things that they tested that effectively beat 
facial recognition software. Having that haircut <laughs> beats facial recognition software. So it gets to this point of like, okay, so the machines can't find you. And corporations have determined that human labor is too expensive. What happens now? Nobody's going to sit there with the mugshot book to figure out if that's you. They're not. And it's fascinating. I mean, here's an actual render out of it, you know, directly from his research. You know, even just by putting that up there and taking two photos and comparing them, it's not able to detect it. I mean, this isn't, you know, different angles and stuff, but there's also, they tested this directly against face.com's API and PhotoTagger. They post 15 photos of this woman at different angles, yaw, pitch, roll, all kinds of stuff. No matching faces detected out of all 15 photos. Um, so we discussed facial recognition. We're going to blow through iris recognition real quick. Contact lenses, they kind of work. Um, I take that back. They, they reasonably work. Um, folks want you to think that contact lenses don't work nearly as well as they do. Um, there's a bunch of different strategies as far as measuring uh, dithering printouts and stuff like that on the actual contact lenses to be able to uh, measure predictability. Uh, printouts work. I mean, it's, it's seriously, it's this, it's unlikely, but it, it really comes down to Nyquist Shannon, which is like, you know, if you can double the sample rate of the source that you're trying to generate, then you can match a data set. I mean, this is the idea of, you know, being able to hear audio. That's, you know, why it was thought, you know, doing uh, stereo 22 kilohertz channels will produce, you know, high enough quality audio that you can not tell degradations in it, you know. So to defend against that, they do a two-dimension Fourier transfer on the image, but, you know, Every camera has a max resolution, including the one that they are using to measure this. If you can beat the resolution of that camera sufficiently with what you are photographing to then produce that output, I mean, it's, it's, it's done. And so the same with video. I mean, ideally, they're going to be using video so that they can watch for slight micro-movements and things like that to be able to detect liveness, as it's called. But, you know, if you've got a high enough camera, it's going to happen. And data recognition. I mean, this is just knowing that, you know, your passenger information is being stored. If you're posting images, your EXIF data has all kinds of stuff in it. You may be sharing geolocation through EXIF and through Facebook. You know, the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act of 2008 in the United States basically says, hey, you cannot, you know, it's safe to have your genome sequenced. It's safe. You can have, you know, 23andMe or these other companies do it. You know, they, you can't be discriminated against based on employment. You can't be discriminated against in health insurance. But there's nothing to say that those companies can't voluntarily give that information up to uh, law enforcement. The battery is low. The battery is low. Yes, I know. Um, fortunately, the talk is just about done as well. So, um, oh, there we go. Um, so we've got like search history, purchase history. Oh. oh, man, there it goes. So I guess that's a good timing for us to move on. Uh, yeah, if you now have questions, raise your hand and I will come to you with the microphone. So, in summary, if you want data removal, that's your strategy. Hello. Yeah. Uh, well, first part is uh, just a comment more than a question that do companies actually believe their bullshit that uh, this is making the world safer? And oh, I mean, it just helps in how you will debate them. What do you think? Uh, there are definitely companies that have true believers that think that you know what they are doing is making the world safer. I mean, don't. I have no doubt that there are individuals within those same companies that all that they see is dollar signs. But, you know, within any of these companies, there are true believers that think that, you know, by God, 
they're doing something useful. Okay. Uh, the next couple of questions is, you said that there were 17 billion records of people with certain companies, but uh, the only way I can imagine that came up to them, if you believe the privacy policies other companies put up, is th there was some kind of black market of da uh, personal data. Not necessarily. I mean, I've worked for uh, Sorry, similar marketing companies to that, and you know they they publish those types of statistics as a bragging thing. To, as you know, that's their marketing material to be able to say, no, really, you should you should give us money. You know, we've got information on this many people, um, and. The bigger thing is how much of that has been deduplicated. Okay. You know, it, I, I would suspect that those numbers are actually inflated for marketing purposes to be able to sell or to more effectively sell their services, but that's only personal experience with seeing data sets like that. But originally they must have come from somewhere. Yes. Um, I mean, you, you get information like that from, like I said, voter file. You'll get it from various nonprofit groups. Um, non a lot of nonprofit groups will have sharing agreements like that. So I'll give you my mailing list if you give me yours. And you know, my mailing list is more valuable to you if I've got phone numbers, addresses, click through rates on emails, things like that. So. Uh, So the question was if he mistags photos uh, that were. I mean, misinformation is always. That's what I was. Yeah. So his question was if uh, he was to post photo or human-like photos of himself, um, you know, potentially mannequin photos, things like that is what I'm assuming, uh, and then tag them on Facebook, uh, you know, would that be a successful misinformation tactic? And, you know, I, I certainly think that it would. Um, it's going to become interesting when mo multiple people start doing that, you know, because mannequins all have relatively similar faces, so, you know, you're going to end up with a dozen uh, people a dozen bodies that are all, you know, the same, you know, 2,000 people. And that's, it's an interesting problem to try to attack. And I, I can't, I can't off the top of my head come up with anything really obvious of what they would do to counter that outside of, you know, just kind of setting up like the equivalent of a spam corpus. You know, when you have a spam trap address at your domain, where anything that matches that, you know, immediately gets flagged out. You know, it's potential that they would both flag out that image and potentially flag your account uh, just for, you know, questionable tactics, whatever. But do we have any other questions? Yes, we have some questions from the internet here. Okay. Yeah, I have one question from Sai through personal communication. He is asking about CV Dazzle. Okay. Um, his question is, isn't this necessarily a makeup arms race? A real system would be able to tell where the face is because it's on top of a moving body. And this attack will only work on the current generation of algorithms, especially if it's taking a serious attack that the terrorists might use the next generation of face recognition will counter it or just make, make a varying weird makeup in public illegal. <laughs> I mean, so th that's a fantastic point. I mean, you, it, there are strategies like that now where, you know, you can't wear, you know, a face mask into a bank. You can't, you know, cover your face when you go into various stores. And, you know, trying to legislate issues like that is going to be, at, at best, maybe doable on a local level. You know, it's, I would see it being a challenge, at least in the United States, to happen at the state or the federal level. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't speak to uh, any specific European laws about that. Now, as far as the ability to track movement and, you know, more effectively do that, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that's, there are individuals who are paid to work on these algorithms. And, I mean, it's going to be a game of cat and mouse. And I think that's part of the fascinating thing about it. You know, it's, you know... Adam Harvey is looking at this as, you know, how effective can he make it, you know? And 
you know, it, it's no fun if there's not a chance of losing or having to do it again. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, part of a thesis project that he did, and, um, you know, he's continued working on it, and he's actually looking for assistance um, uh, in developing it further. Um, I mean, if you go to CV Dazzle or do a search for it uh, and go to the website, uh, I mean, he's specifically soliciting individuals uh, for assistance. So. Yeah. And another question from the audience. Hi. Um, what's the false positive rate on these facial recognition things like? Because I've always not really worried on the basis that when you do a Bayesian 101, they say, you know, if you've got a very good test, but you're looking for a needle in a haystack, you're mm -hmm. going to find a lot of needles. So I've never, you know, is the false positive rate now at the point where it doesn't produce too many false alarms? I don't think that the false positive rate is necessarily that high. The false negative rate, though, on the other hand, is, is pretty high. I mean, I saw... In, the statistics are all over the place. You know, it also comes down to which company's algorithms you happen to be looking at. Uh, I saw one where somebody, you know, took a random sampling of a few thousand, uh, a corpus of a few thousand photos, and then pulled out, you know, 25 uh, or 100 or so known photos of that. And the specific percentage rate that they had of success uh, on the first run was 30%. So, um, you know, that's one company, one algorithm, one strategy. Um, but, I mean, this is kind of a capitalist situation where, uh, you know, it's, it's an evolution. You know, whoever is producing the best mousetrap is going to continue evolving and, you know, other ones are going to die off. I mean, uh, there's specifically two um, uh, predominant facial, or w were, as of a few years ago, two predominant facial scanning uh, strategies. One was called uh, Gabor filters, and another one was called PHR. Too many white papers. Um, uh, specifically, it's the same one that um, those uh, sample photos came from, and they talk about the effective rates just of those two different, even sampling strategies on the face, and you know, doing a N minus one comparison of regions around that, and I mean, what they're what they're doing is they're building a kind of level of trust on there, where it says, I I am X percent positive that this is the person, and it's based on well, these areas match 20 percent of the time, and these areas match 60 percent of the time, and you know, it's a, a probability assessment that they're making. Okay, uh, we have more questions from the internet. Okay. Yeah, here's a question from NJ4N through IRC. He asks, um, you mentioned geographic profiling in your abstract, and uh, the question is whether there are any countermeasures against that. Um, so, the, as of right now, it is a challenge at best. The, the best strategy that you've got is trying to turn it off or um, misinformation. Um, you know, it... It really comes down to, with a phone, you know, your cell towers are going to report roughly where you are, you know, you're, even if you've got your GPS turned, turned off and are, you know, filtering it out. Um, as far as, you know, IP location on the computer, that just comes down to proxies. Uh, I mean, all well-worn strategies on that. That's part of why I just gave it lip service and didn't cover it in too much detail. I mean, it's kind of probably a third of the people in this room could at least give you, you know, three things to do to avoid things like that. So, uh, you mentioned the success rate uh, when uh, doing facial recognition on a corpus of a thousand images, mm -hmm. and I can imagine that when you have a very large corpus of images, uh, the factor that human faces look alike factors in. Um, is there any data on that, on and how, when you, for example, have 10 million faces in your database, how many faces are really so much alike that you can filter out who is who? So I, I wasn't able to find things on really, really large data sets, at least that was published. Um, it was a lot of uh, individuals at universities who were going through and filling out all the paperwork and getting consent to take photos of folks and kind of working through this process. and. The largest that I saw, at least in the university realm, was six to 10,000 photos. So it, it doesn't get anywhere near, you know, what a commercial company is going to be doing just on a daily basis. So 
you know, it's, it's one of those where I, I hate to punt it, but I, I really just, I couldn't find anything when I was looking for that, so. And so there are no more questions from the internet. Does anybody in the audience has any questions left? Nobody? So yeah, then thank you for your talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>